So what does the Old Testament say? You might be studying with the best of intentions. You're ready to dive right in, but soon you're drowning in ceremonial rules and endless genealogies. The truth is, from the beginning, God has been telling one great big story, and we are living in our own chapter right now. The Old Testament is the foundation of our story of faith. It provides the context for everything that comes after it. Journey with us as we uncover this singular phenomenal story and shed light on passages that deepen our understanding. This is a story that only God is big enough to tell. A story that is without doubt epic. So here it is. Jesus lived perfectly died sacrificially, and was raised victoriously. That is the gospel. That's the good news because the truth is you're not good enough. You know it and God knows it. See, he set this standard that he knew none of us could reach. He knew that when he created us, he would have to come save us because we would mess it up and never be able to get back on track fully. And so he knew to say, let there be light and to create us in his image would require him, out of his love for us, to send his son, the only one who could meet that perfect standard required for residency in heaven. And he still created us. That's how much he loved us. That is the story of the entire Bible. God on a mission to save us through, out of our mess. His name is Jesus. And so in Epic, what we're doing is we're discovering the story because when you discover the story of creation, it makes sense of your story. And some of us have been confused about what's going on in our lives. And secondly, when you understand the story, you can actually understand the little stories in Scripture because they fit as part of this massive epic tale of God saving us from our mess. What happens here is really important. Like we gather every week and for about an hour, we focus and we ask God to speak to us and be very real to us and draw us to himself. But that's like an hour and you have another 111 per week waking hours. So what happens between the worship services becomes really important in your spiritual development. So in Epic, what we're doing is we're coming alongside you and helping you hear from God out of his word. Because a lot of times people read their Bible and they're like, oh, this Old Testament stuff is weird. I'm going to skip ahead to the New Testament. We don't want you to do that because there is a beautiful message from God for you in the Old Testament. So we've invited you to be here every weekend, to get in a small group where you can have a group praying for you, encouraging you, helping you. We've, we're even sending you an email every day if you've accepted our email list kind of thing so we can teach you the story. And then we kicked off this whole thing with OT Live. So we did that already. We've got another one coming up. And the cool thing is once you register once, like you're registered for keeps, you can come as many times as you want. The emails are for free. You can bring your kid for free. In step one, you get to come for free. All of that, we're trying to give you Tools whereby you can hear from God and he change your life. And I've been so proud of you. Hundreds of you are following along with the email and learning the hand signs so you can tell the story of God. You guys are even following along well enough that I received multiple emails that day 11 had a mistake in it. Yes, you're paying attention, and yes, I messed up. So we took care of that one. Man, I'm just really proud of you. And, and if you're new with this, let me, let me catch you up just a little bit where we're at in the story. Let me give you the first 10, which actually is 25% of the entire story found in the Old Testament. So follow along, and then I'm going to let you do it with me. So here's the story. So creation, God created in six dramatic events, speaking Creation into existence. We were day six. Adam and Eve fell, having disobeyed God, and the world is still impacted by that. Mankind continued on that path, and God sent the flood to judge our sin. Then even after the flood, we were not obedient, and so he spread us out by creating nations. The story gets personal when he called Abraham and said of him, I'm going to make your descendants like the stars of the sky. You want to be able to count them. And then there will be the one who brings salvation to all people. It started with little Isaac as the fulfillment of that promise. 
Jacob as the grandson who wrestled with God and was renamed Israel. Joseph as one of the 12 sons that would bring Israel to Egypt and thereby save them from starvation. But they would then become feared foreigners and God would raise up Moses to set his people free. And here's our passage for today. They would paint the blood over their doors that God would pass over. All right, it's your turn to do it with me. Everybody stand. And as you stand, look at your neighbor and say, I love crowd participation. I almost believed you. Almost believed you. All right, we're going to go slow the first time, then we'll do it one time for fun. Okay, so first one's creation. So here we go. Creation, fall, flood, nations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, pass over. Very good. You guys are doing awesome. Okay. One more time together. So here we go. Creation, fall, flood, nations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, pass over. Okay. Leave your hand right there. Turn around and give somebody a high five. You did it. Woo! Very good. You can sit down. All right. We're having some fun today. We're putting the pieces together. And if you have your Bible or your Bible app, we're headed to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. So let's real ca- catch up real quick. Since we left the story last week, remember, we talked about the fall. Adam and Eve blew it brought sin to us, we would have done the same thing. We are vulnerable to sin. God then spoke to Abraham and said, hey, Abraham, through you, I'm going to bless all people. Gave him the promised son, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. Joseph was the one that God positioned in Egypt to save his people because a famine hit. And it was because of Joseph that he was able to bring all of his family to Egypt as favored guests. But over time, generation, the new Pharaoh was scared. They became feared foreigners. He enslaved them, abused them, tried to slow them down. And God's people cried out for help. God, help us. God, help us. We're in a mess. We're slaves. This is awful. And God heard their prayer by calling a man named Moses to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. We might guess Pharaoh wasn't a fan of that message. He's like, man, why why would I give up my workforce? Like this is working out really good for me. And so then God began to send some plagues on to Egypt. And these plagues, they were plagues, they were awful. And yet they were designed by God to say, hey, Pharaoh, you're not God. I am God. So, I mean, back up to chapter 7, you see the list. There was water turned into blood. Frogs came upon the land. Then gnats, flies, boils, hail. I mean, it kept getting worse. Locusts eating up all their crops, darkness, they could not see anyone. And what you see as these plagues are unfolding is that Pharaoh would say, Oh, yeah, and then he would renege. Oh, yeah, and then he'd renege. And then as you come to like eight and nine, you see this hardness in Pharaoh's heart. Like he's just like, No way, no way am I going to let those people go. Which brings us to the 10th. And final plague. So here's number 10 as God describes through Moses what he was going to do in the land of Egypt to declare that he was the one true God and it was going to be harsh. Verse 12 of chapter 12. I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Plague number 10 was simply that God was going to come through Egypt and death was going to hit. The firstborn child, 
firstborn animal. Every home. Dramatic. But then, did, did, you, did you notice the second part of that verse? Like, look at this highlight. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Like there's something spiritual happening. It's not just that God keeps making the plagues worse. This one is spiritual. This one is a climax of epic proportions. What is he talking about? If I give you two clues, it'll make more sense. The Egyptians were pantheists, and they were also polytheists. Uh, uh, Pantheism means that you think creation is an extension of the divine. So back then in Egypt, they did, and most cultures thought, you know, I can become one with God through creation. You may have even heard somebody say that to you, like, I connect with God. I just feel a connection with God. And what they're talking about is a tree or creation. The Egyptians were also polytheistic, meaning that they believed in many gods. So not only is creation an extension of the divine, there are many gods in creation. And you could see it in their worship. So way back then, like they would worship a river god to protect their crops or provide water. They would worship the sun god for good weather. They would worship a fertility god so their wife could have a child. They worship the gods selfishly. If we can make the gods happy, then we'll get out of life what we want. And as Americans, we have so civilized that. We still do it. We call it the American dream. Because we think, man, if I get the right job, if I have the right kind of authority or power or influence, if I have health, if I have the right friends, connections, networking, then I'll have the good life. And we're willing to do acts of worship, giving our hearts to, going all in, to get those degrees, to get those opportunities, to secure those friends, to attract the right people so that we can have the good life. And and here's what God is saying about those gods in Egypt. They fall short. They don't save. They don't deliver as promised. And so he says, I I am the Lord. Like this is not a competition between God and the other gods. This is not God being insecure and saying, "Oh, I need to increase my following on social media." No, 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 no. He's saying, "Hey, all that other stuff you can give your life to, all those other gods you can worship, all those things you can run after, they will fall short. I, I, I'm the only one. I'm the only one." I am the Lord. I'm the one who has been on a mission to save you from your sins from the beginning. I'm the one who charted out this plan to send my son to be the savior of the world. I'm the one. I am the Lord. This, This plague, as pronounced, is spiritual. It's not just consequences. And then... We find that the 10th plague was different in how it was received by the people who lived in Egypt called the Hebrews. Look at the next verse. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So the key is really clear. I don't even need to highlight it for you, but we did. The blood. So just like we've been talking about in this series, everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus and moves the story forward to Jesus. From the beginning, God required blood as a payment, a covering for our sins. Ultimately, We see this expressed in Jesus. So this morning, as we talk about 
Passover and what all that means, we're actually going to give you an opportunity to take communion. Passover is the foundation for what we celebrate in communion, Lord's Supper, Eucharist. I don't know what you grew up calling it, but we have an opportunity to celebrate what Jesus did for us. And he established that practice based in Passover. Okay, so the blood would be placed on the door. Now, catch this other phrase. It shall be a sign for you. So when I see the blood, that's why our hand sign is pass over. When I see the blood over your door, I will pass over. What does that mean? It means he will pass over and cover that home. He will protect it from the death that is coming through the land. And that blood on your door is a sign. What's it a sign of? Points to Jesus, it's a sign of faith. Faith. Here's why. God commanded his people on the 10th day, it's actually four steps. On the 10th day, pick an unblemished lamb, like a perfect one, a really good one. You're going to, number two, keep it in your home from the 10th day to the 14th day. And then on the 14th day, you're going to slaughter that lamb. You're actually going to drain the blood from its body. That lamb is going to die for your family. Number four, you're going to paint that blood on the door, and you're going to eat that lamb in celebration of God's salvation to you. And it's exactly what happened. On that night, the death angel came through Egypt, and where there was blood over the door, God covered, protected those homes. But every house that was not painted with blood, death reigned. Both their child and their animal, dead. And God said, I am the Lord. And Pharaoh responded with, please leave my country. Which brings us to the next verse, where God says, this day shall be for you. So every year on this same day, you will have a memorial day. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast, a celebration of God's goodness. So what happened there in Egypt was so dramatic that it actually reset their calendar. This was now going to be the first month of the year. The 14th day would be the day of feast when they celebrated God delivering them from slavery in Egypt. And every year forward, this would be a high and holy celebration to this day. Jesus utilized Passover with his disciples the night before he went to the cross and gave his life for us. We said Jesus died sacrificially. The night before he went to the cross, he took Passover, the cup and the bread, and he said, this cup all along has been a picture of my blood. This bread all along has been foretelling my blood life. And you already noticed some of our people are already stepping out because they're getting ready to serve you the cup and the bread. Everything in the Old Testament moving us forward to and pointing to Jesus. Jesus on that night with his disciples said, hey, um, the Passover lamb died for those homes, each family. Ultimately, it's my death for your sin. Bread with no yeast, symbolic of no sin, ultimately that's my life. Not one of you could perfectly obey all of the commands of God. Not one of you could qualify yourself to be in eternity forever in God's uninhibited, perfect presence. So I did it for you. And he showed them in communion, him fulfilling God's promise by going to the cross. So today we're going to take communion. 
What communion is, is a statement of, I trust Jesus. This morning, we're going to do it just a little bit differently. Enough differently that if you do communion with us every month, you're going to be like, oh, that was a different. That was a, hmm, a, a different way of doing it. That was, oh, a reminder of why we do it. One of the things you will notice that's going to be different is that we are using matzah bread. What they would have called back then the afakoman. And you will notice of this bread that it kind of looks like a cracker because it has no yeast. Again, symbolic of no sin. We'll come back to that after we take communion. You will also notice of this bread, there are holes and there are stripes. Again, God beautifully keeping his promise. Isaiah foretelling of the coming Messiah who would be pierced for our transgressions. And that by his stripes, we would be healed. Jesus said, that's, that's me. That is me. When you come and are served today, you're going to have an opportunity to take and break off a piece. And yes, we're going to have a few crumbs that land on the floor and you'll be like, <gasps> okay, it, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Some of you are going to get bigger pieces. You needed more Jesus than some of us did, you know. <laughs> and don't get paralyzed. You're like, oh, I just got a little piece. It, it, it doesn't matter the amount. You're just going to break off a piece for you. So you're grabbing yours. And then you're going to move on to where you will then be offered the cup. I trust Jesus. That's what you're saying when you take communion. So if you're not yet ready to trust Jesus as your Savior, it's actually inappropriate for you to take communion. You can either stay right where you're at. You could even come through the line and kind of watch while we declare we trust Jesus. But one way or the other, if you're not ready to trust Christ as your Savior, just, just stay back and watch. And at Cornerstone, you know we celebrate that we're all at different stages of the journey. And the last thing we want to do is push you to do something you're not ready for. So just watch in. It's, it's, it's awesome. If you are ready to say, I trust Jesus, you're going to make your way to your right, down in front to be served. So you're going to come first break off a piece for you. And as you take that piece of bread, symbolizing your part of what Jesus provided for us, I want you to make eye contact with the person serving you and tell him, I trust Jesus. You're then going to step over to where you are served the cup, pull one out of the tray. Again, make eye contact with the person serving you and tell them, I trust Jesus. Take the bread, take the cup. You're going to go back to your seat, sit down, and then we'll all take communion together. As you're sitting down or making your way back to your seat, I want you to look at the slide on the screen, and I want you to ask the Lord, are there any areas in my life that I've not been trusting you? Any place I'm anxious any place that I have uh, kind of said, oh, oh, this, this is mine. I got to get this straightened out. Jesus, is there any area that you would say, trust me? And while you sit in your chair, take that opportunity to say, Jesus, I trust you with that relationship. Jesus, I trust you with those finances. Jesus, I trust you with my help. Jesus, uh, with my help. Jesus, I trust you with everything. Let this be a beautiful opportunity for you to discover for the first time or again a declaration today of your faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're not going to sing while we're served. We're simply going to have a little music going on so that you can come and be served and then return back to your seat that we can take communion together. So let me pray over our time of communion and then we'll have you come forward to be served. Oh God, thank you for this beautiful opportunity to say we trust Jesus. Oh God, may you use this beautiful, ordained ordinance of your church to help us declare the gospel, taste the gospel, receive the gospel. We are so thankful that you are our provision, that you saved us through Jesus and we get to respond with faith. We get to say yes. 
God, thank you for what you are stirring in us, in our hearts, and our spirits right now. Thank you, O oh God, for the hope that we have in Jesus. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. A special thanks to our servers this weekend going above and beyond that we could celebrate communion in just a little bit different way, but uh, one that caused a lot of logistics to make possible for you. So when we take communion, we're recognizing Jesus' declaration that he was fulfilling completely what was foretold in Passover. In taking of communion, we are making a dramatic declaration, I trust Jesus, that he lived perfectly for me, that he died sacrificially for me, that he's inviting me to experience life through him. So as we prepare to take communion, go ahead and repeat the good confession after me that we might boldly declare together in unison as a church. Repeat after me, please. I believe Jesus is the Christ, I Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God, Son of the living God. My, Lord my, my Lord and my Savior. Because you have declared, I trust Jesus. Because you have declared your faith together. It is with much joy that I invite you to hear the words of Jesus that he said to his disciples and today are also for you. He said to them, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. And because of your faith, these words are also for you. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This you do every time you drink of it, remembering me. Thanks be to God. When we gather to worship in communion, we taste the gospel. When we gather to worship, we taste the presence of God. But experiencing the presence of God, even worship, is not something that is to just happen here. The gospel is to impact our life every day of our lives. Let me tell you a quick little story about our eight-year-old, Trine. Here's a little picture of her. That's what I think, yeah. <laughs> so, some time ago, Trine, like most kids, had some bad dreams. And she said, hey, Daddy, would you pray for me? And so it became a special tradition for us, and she would say, hey, Daddy, are you ready to pray over me? And so I would pray, and I would ask God to protect her and keep her mind clear that she would have a good night's sleep, and, and it became just something really special between us. And then along the way, I realized, oh, wait a minute, like she's putting her hope in my faith that I would pray a faith-filled prayer and God would answer my prayer to protect her. And so just about a week ago, as a dad, I realized, oh, I need to pass the baton of faith to my daughter. And so I said, hey, Trine, I'm still going to pray for you. That's what dads get to do for their little girls. But when you have a dream, this is an opportunity for you to trust Jesus. So I taught her a simple little prayer. It's not directly out of scripture, just a simple little eight-year-old kind of prayer. And just to give you a little context, Trine has not yet fully professed faith in Jesus. She's super close, so she's not been baptized. She's not uh, prayed and received Christ as Savior, but man, is she super close. And so I said, hey, Trine, when you have one of those dreams, here's what I want you to pray. I want you to say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I trust you. Thank you for saving me. I said, Trine, you can trust Jesus. You, he'll take care of you. And so it took us a few nights to get it down because she wasn't sure she could pray it, right? But now that's her prayer. You see, faith in Jesus will change your life. 
absolutely change your life. You can trust him with whatever that area is you're struggling with, the one that brings you anxiety, the one that brings you an unsettled feeling, the one that continues to knock you off course. You can trust Jesus with that. And I invite you to do that. And as we look in our passage, we see that pattern of faith. Remember, they painted the blood over their door in faith, believing that God was going to do what he promised he would do. And then the very next verse, they are told to practice this feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So check out verse 15. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. So this is right after Passover. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leaven from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Now I need to give you one little piece that's already established in God's word. Leaven represents sin. And so by removing the leaven, what God's people were saying is, hey, we care about sin in our lives. We want to get it out. Now, the order is really important to understand. Feast of Passover, God's provision for our salvation. Next day, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Get the sin out of your life. And the verse is really strong. Like if you don't care about the yeast in your home, like if you can do Passover and then not passionately look around your house and get rid of the yeast symbolic of sin in your family's life, uh, you're to be removed from the people of God because you're not living as a person of God. I mean, really firm. And man, do we need to hear that message. I remember the first time I heard the message. I usually tell the story in step one. I was a child raised in church, and I came to faith in Jesus at a very early age. But along the way, God confronted me with how I was living Jesus as my Savior, but not Jesus as my Lord. I said, Jesus saved me, but then I was continuing to live like a punk teenager and continuing on that course of just doing what I wanted to do. And I remember the night, and it was dramatic when God revealed to me that I was separating the two. And the gospel is really clear. There is nothing you can do. There is no path forward for you to straighten up your life and to earn a ticket to heaven. You can't do it. We all fall short. Having received the gospel, having received the righteousness of Christ, we are thereby free from sin. Now, we're going to struggle with them. I'll talk about that in just a second. But you are free from sin. You are free from the condemnation that you deserve because of your sin. And you are free from the bondage you once had from sin. You couldn't break loose. To continue to sin... Like you used to, is, is unthinkable, unacceptable, unconscionable. As you see in James chapter 2, faith without works is dead, useless. Faith in Jesus changes your life. To act like it doesn't is to separate ourselves from the gospel. That's why in the New Testament, Jesus would say, hey, when somebody sins against you and you go to them and you do the four steps... If that person still doesn't care, they are unrepentant. If they're like, I don't even care how I sinned against you, treat them as an unbeliever. Doesn't mean you hate them, doesn't mean you hurt them, or anything like that. Just, just recognize they're not living as children of God. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul would say to the church in Corinth, hey, turn that guy over to Satan. Because to do what he's doing, he's proving that he's not living as a child of God. Turn him over with the hope that God will bring him back. We cannot continue to follow a path of sin after experiencing salvation through Jesus. So, adding to I trust Jesus, we must also add I follow Jesus. 
So where for you is your life not lining up with Jesus? What area of your life would you say, man, that, that's, that's no good? My mouth, man, I still, my eyes, I still view, my temper, gossip, coveting, my desire, like, which of those in your journey of following Jesus is not lining up? And have you allowed yourself to slip into that attitude of, eh, eh, it's my only vice. It's just a white lie. Everybody else is doing it. To say, Jesus, you are my Savior, is also to declare, Jesus, you are my Lord. Oh, God, show me. Show me the ways in which I'm not yet fully following Jesus. I, I want to pursue you this week. For some of you, you may know immediately what that area is. Ask him for help. Holy Spirit, bring the conviction back because I don't want to keep going down that path. Holy Spirit, help me because I keep sliding off. God, give me that small group. Give me those friends who can encourage me. Give me that, that, that accountability partner who will ask me because I don't want to settle anymore because I follow Jesus. And there's going to be ups and downs. Believe me, I have them. But the journey is, as I love saying, up and to the right. Don't allow yourself the freedom of saying, yeah. Because to accept the forgiveness of Jesus is also to accept the lordship of Jesus, whereby we say, Jesus, I not only trust that you provided forgiveness for my sins, I also trust that your way is best. I'm following you. God, help me as I seek to follow you today. That is how we get to respond now and in the remainder of this week. Let me pray for us today. Lord, we are so thankful for this fun discovery that we are on, seeing the gospel all over the Old Testament. And today in this beautiful picture of the sacrifice of Jesus found way back there in Exodus, in Passover. God, thank you for how you are clearly revealing your plan to bring salvation to us through Jesus. Lord, may we be convicted by all those passages that we've skipped over in the past that show your law and call your people to live differently because they were your people. God, may you convict us today as your people that we would live differently. Not trying to live differently so you'll take us, but because you've already accepted us to live differently because we know who we are. God, continue to stir, bring conviction, bring hope, bring friends, bring perseverance that we might more fully experience the salvation that Jesus died to make possible right now and into eternity. Father, receive our worship. We come sometimes distracted. We come before you sometimes thinking about other things. Holy Spirit, draw us and receive our worship of Almighty God through Jesus Christ. And it is in his name we pray. Amen.